happening me now, the first Tuesday of the month, newest but recurring guest, creator of How to Barbecue Right, pitmaster of Killer Hogs Barbecue Team, friend of this show, Malcolm Reed. Malcolm, how are you, buddy? I'm good, Greg. Man, it's hard to believe it's been a month already. I know, man. Time is flying by. I mean, you'll find out once you get on board with this train, man. You think you got time to geek it out and punch up and get all your stuff ready and then all of a sudden before you know it i'm like hey we're ready to go any questions and you're like whoa man it's like four weeks have blown right by so what have you been up to recently man it's it's been a whirlwind around here i've been to the bahamas and back cooked in a steak contest put out a couple videos and and tried to stay warm the whole time too i mean yeah. which it wasn't hard to do in the bahamas no I, I would assume that's pretty easy but uh, coming back up here especially in cleveland today i mean we're single digits at best it's starting to snow again which i thought maybe although we're in cleveland so i mean it can snow all the way through june for crying out loud depending on how the wind blows off the lake but before we get into a little bit of a recap on that sca van over in green turtle i want to talk to you uh, for some time to talk on these developing issues for what many consider to be the biggest barbecue event during the course of any calendar year, specifically Memphis in May. And there seems to be some type of a discrepancy on park renovation and are we going to have room for teams and the real Memphis in May competition. So what do you know about it and where do we sit with it currently? Well, I mean, that, that's exactly it. Um, it, it. What's happening is the city is um, – got a new company coming in for a plan to kind of revitalize some of the, the Tomley Park, which is where Memphis and May has been held for ever since it started. I mean, it, it was, you know, it was formed right there. And um, the plan that they've done, it's really changing up some. It, not only is it affecting um, us barbecuers, it's also affecting Bill Street Music Festival, which is a huge draw. Mm. Um, you know, the, the month of May, the Memphis in May, is, it, there's a lot of events that go on there in Tomley Park the whole month, and, and it's really affecting the whole thing, and it's got everybody just kind of up in arms over it. When you look at the park and you know the history of this whole thing, was there an issue with how the park has been set up? Is this a idea that was just sparked here over the last handful of months, and we decide, okay, this is the time we're going to try and get something done, and they're not really using any type of foresight as to what other events it might be affecting. Well, it, 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 I hate to say it, but it seems, and I'm no authority, but it seems like that that they're really not concerned with what it's going to do to the barbecue fest or even the music fest. I mean, they've they've got kind of a plan, but what we've seen um, from their pre preliminary plans, it, it, there's no way it's feasible for it to work for barbecue. Um, there's way too much infrastructure that needs to be there as far as um, the guys said, you know, the setting up the electrical, setting up the utilities, setting up the scaffolding, all the, you know, all the lanes we need just to get equipment in aren't there. And you can't just cram all, all of us guys in one area down there and just have us all side by side any tighter than what it already is. It just won't work. So either they're going to lose teams or, um, you know, they're going to have to change locations if they're going with that plan. Malcolm Reed joining me here on the show, how to bbqright.com, the website. Obviously, you can find them on YouTube as well, Pitmaster Killer Hogs Barbecue Team, How to Barbecue Right on all the social media channels as well. You plan on cooking uh, Memphis in May, assuming everything is still in working order by then? Oh, yeah. You know, this year, it's not going to affect it. We've kind of got another problem this year with the rising river. That's, yeah, that's right. one thing. We don't know what's going on with it right now. But um, this doesn't really go into effect until after May. So Memphis and May is going as planned this year. So it'll all go into effect next year with what they're wanting to do. And that's that's really what's concerning a lot of us. Um, I, I mean, we're, we're cooking and we've already got our acceptance and everything. So we're moving forward with this year just um, as, as normal. Quick question on cookers, Malcolm, since you have a bunch of them from a competition standpoint, will you throw some use on that Jambo at this year's Memphis and May or will you stay with what you've always used prior? I'm, I, I'm planning on taking the jambo and that's going to be my showpiece. That's the one that I'm going to put out front. We're going to cook. A, we're actually doing the rib category this year and I'm going to do ribs on the jambo at Memphis in May. I think it's going to give them a great flavor. I'm going to be able to, you know, show off several slabs at once on that cooker and it can hold a ton of ribs and it's going to look slick parked right up front. Let me ask you about when you, 
put that thought into choosing the protein. So it's ribs, it's whole hog, or it's pork shoulder. There's no brisket. There's no chicken or anything like that um, that can take the overall. So you win the category itself, and then the winners then go against each other to form an overall grand champion for the folks that don't know it. But it's always been my thought that if a whole hog cook steps up to the plate, they seem to have an advantage because it is a huge showpiece. It is a lot of attention to cooking a whole bunny, uh, a whole load of different muscles, having them have to come out right. It seems like you could cook a really great rib, but if somebody cooks a better whole hog or, or a decent whole hog, they might have a, a leg up or they might get some type of a special consideration. Is that not the case? Well, you hate to say that because you want to say everybody's got a fair chance. So with me going back to ribs, I think I got a good chance. But, you know, you are at a little bit disadvantage. When, when you choose that whole hog, I mean, you've got to cook it right. Don't get me wrong. Sure. But you've got so much more meat to give those judges to pull from. And when you cook ribs, that's all you have is a slab of ribs. So um, ribs haven't won in, man, I, I would say well over – a dozen years. I couldn't tell you the last time they did win. I mean, are we probably... looking at a Mike Mills last time ribs won well, it kind of a thing, or has it been after that? There's been there's been a few after that, but I know uh, we started cooking ribs back in 06, and there hasn't been one, you know, there hasn't been a rib winner since I've been involved, involved cooking down there. Hmm. So that tells you how far it goes back. I think it was like 04, don't quote me on it, but it was a couple years before we really got started, um, was, a you know, the last rib team. And, you know, there's been some great guys. Mark West has won ribs three times down there. Um, and he has, you know, he, he's been close. But they, I guess he's the closest guy that I know personally that's come close to winning it all with the rib. Um, shoulders, it seems to rotate from shoulder to hog every year. And we, we were in shoulders uh, for the past six years. But we just want a new location. It's, um, you know, we kind of got burnout on our spot where we are. I want we're, We were always down on the far end away from everybody. I want to be kind of in the middle in the thick of things this year maybe get some better visibility and, and go, i'm going to have a good time of course i want to win yeah but i want to go have a good time and see everybody and just try a new location out and shoulder man and no uh no disrespect but chris Lilly is a bitch on that category i mean he's typically the guy that's coming out and he's won it five different times he's, he's hard to guard he is the man to beat in shoulder category him and mark lambert they seem to they seem to go back and forth being up there in shoulders but but yeah and, and we were we're about six spots down from Chris. So, you know, we're bumping judges <laughs> the whole time. And and I'm looking to get away from him a little bit. <laughs> Malcolm Reed joining me here on the show. Uh, Malcolm, let's go ahead and talk a little bit about that uh, Green Turtle Key or Green Turtle K trip you took to the Bahamas. There was a Stay Cook-Off Association event that was folded into this. But how did the trip come up? What was it all about? Well, um, Brad and Susan from Grill Greats, uh, um, they they have a house down there in Green Turtle Key, and they're great people. You know, we couldn't I couldn't cook the steaks I cook without those Grill Greats. I think that's the one thing you find in common. There's all kinds of grills out there, but just about everybody has a set of those. And so they wanted to host a contest uh, down there in the winter, which was a great time. There wasn't a whole lot going on around, and it was cold here. So why not go to the Bahamas and cook a contest? Was it any different than a normal con? I mean, aside from being in a palatial area and great weather on a beach was it pretty much a, the same setup and go that you would do something akin here domestically it was um the only thing we didn't bring our grills uh, brad had brought down um i guess man he must have had 26 uh, weber grills like 22 inch kettles for us to cook on i uh, had the grill grates had us a grill glove the tools a thermometer knives cutting boards all we had to do was show it with some seasonings which made it really easy. And the SEA guys, Brett and Ken and, and Danny, they, they kind of repped the contest. So it went, I mean, it went off without a hitch. And they had some great steaks from Snake River Farms. And, you know, we all got our two steaks and did the best we could in the wind there on the beach. And I didn't come up very good. I mean, I was like 21st, but I think I'd had so many of those rum drinks by that time. I didn't really care. <laughs> so how many teams are in that? Uh, there were 28. There were 28 teams, and they had 26 grills, but there were a couple husbands and wives that uh, used the same grill. And so they just kind of had – we all were just right there elbow to elbow, sharing tables and, you know, helping each other out if need be. I mean, we, we fought the fire a little bit. Um, you know, the wind made it a little challenging to to get those Webers uh, where we wanted them, where we're used to running them. But um, all in all, it was a great cook. Are you a PK grill guy otherwise? 
I, you know, that's what I cook on all the SCA events. Um, I've just got, I started out cooking on Weber, so I'm, I was familiar with cooking on them. I still cook on them at the home, but yep. as far as SCA goes, I cook on PK with grill grates. You've seen the growth of competitive steak, obviously. Where do you see that whole thing? And there are now a bunch of different, well, not a bunch, but at least, you know, three or four different sanctioning bodies. You got SCA, you have the American Competitive Steak Association that's based out of Columbus, Ohio. You have whatever version that uh, KCBS is trying to trot out. Where do you see competitive steak as a whole over the next handful of years? I see it grow. I mean, it's steady growing. I like what they're doing. They're adding uh, other categories, like they're adding a ribs in some of them. And, you know, they're, they're in position where the guys running that are really listening to the cooks, and they're not scared to make changes as they need be. If it's a, if it's a, a change that makes sense to them, because that's the Brett and Kim were cooks first too, before they started the SCA. And they're, they're just, they're all about the cooks and making it easy on everybody from the organizer to the reps, to the us cooks. So I think that, I mean, it's a great thing. I mean, there's, there's, there's plenty of room for growth in, in the steak cooking world. I mean, and you see about how many is popping up. Every little town's doing a steak contest now. Malcolm, can you break down your steak technique for us when it comes to the competition side of things? Man, I don't get real crazy with it, Greg. I, you know, I'm, I'm a salt pepper guy. I, I got a, you know, my AP season, salt, pepper, garlic. That's the first thing I usually put on them. Yeah. Uh, when I get my steaks, I trim them up a little bit, but I don't get real aggressive. I'm, I try to pick a steak because, uh, you know, they lay them out on the table and yeah. we get to pick two steaks. So I try to pick one that's got some decent marbling to it. Not too much fat around the eye. I want I want some, but I don't want too, too much because I don't want it to fall apart on me. And then if it has a tail on it, that's fine. I can trim that off. I just try to get a decent decent ribeye. And then I look for one with a good spinalis because that's what they're judging us on when they're tasting. Or at least I want them to judge me on the best part of the steak. And then we're trying to nail the tenderness across the eye. And so I get one that you know has a decent size eye on it to where when they cut it at the cut table, there's enough meat there for them to see how well I cooked it. Um, the cook process is simple. I hit it with a little AP. I use a little bit of like a a traditional barbecue rub, not real sweet. I use, I use my hot rubs. I don't want a lot of sugar on it, but I want that pepperiness. And that's just for color. And then I finish it off with a little bit of ground steak seasoning and you can use any kind of steak seasoning, but it's all about, it's all about, you know, cooking a steak that's going to really resonate with the judges. It has a good steak flavor, but it's it's really, you got to nail that medium. And that's the challenge in these things, hitting that medium temperature. Where are you pulling it off? And how much degrees are you accounting for carryover when you let it rest? Well, it, it depends on um, what the temperature is outside, what the conditions are like. I've seen them done at 128, carrying over to about 133. Hmm. I've, I've taken them off at 132 and I carry over to about 137. They're usually going up about five degrees with a little rest, but you got to think if it's real cold outside like it is now, you got different conditions. So I may take it just a little bit further because I know it's, you know, I need it. But if it's real hot, I'll take it off at like 128 in the summertime. So it it just kind of depends on the feel of the weather that day. You know, Malcolm, I didn't realize from a competition barbecue standpoint (laughs) until maybe six or seven years ago. And I think I was talking to Melissa Cookson, actually. We were talking about, flavors and do you hit it with them anything before you run them to the judge 10 or anything like this and she had said hey you know when we practice at home we dial in our seasonings on lukewarm and cool barbecue because that's pretty much what the judges are tasting it would be fruitless for us to try and tweak those on hot meat and thusly the flavor profile is going to change when the meat cools off does a similar thing go for the steak, or do you think, or do you find that the judges are getting warmer to hot steak after turning? Well, they try to get it to them as hot as possible, and I've found just by cooking them at home. Now that now I was cooking when it was a little warmer outside, that they will carry over and they'll stay pretty warm for a while. So they're they're not getting stone cold unless they're just piled up on the cut table. Um, and, but what I do is I try to time it and I try to see what's going in. I don't just jump in right at the very beginning of the window because, you know, you've got 30 minute window in stakes. That's pretty widespread oh, out yeah. for a normal size contest. I mean, you can, you know, you can go in and it not be backed up. Chances are you could go straight to a cut table and go right to the judges and you're, you know, you're not losing a whole lot, but um, they do carry over. That's a fact. I mean, I've, I've, I've watched it myself. So um, I try to hit them on that carryover maximum, get them turned in. And as it's falling back down, it's perfect when they get it. 
Malcolm Reed joining me here on the show. All right, so let's get into this little bit of a argument or sidestep here. You had mentioned grill grates. You said you couldn't use grill grates and not have the success that you've had on this particular product. I think if you go to any SCA event or competitive steak event to a by and large degree, 90% of the teams are probably using grill grates to a certain degree. Has it gotten to a point already in its early growth stage to where judges have become accustomed to seeing the grill marks on steaks that grill grates provide to where a team would not want to take a risk and either flip the grill grates over and do like an overall browning, which I think if I was doing a contest, I would do. But then, of course, the little devil on the side, or maybe it's the angel going, hey, stupid, you know how everybody else is going to turn this in. You're going to stick out, and it's not going to be in a creative, let's reward that guy way. It's going to be, that's not what it's supposed to look like, and we're going to penalize him way. Well, you know, I don't know if the judges are really looking for those grill marks, but it seems like the contest that I've cooked, that it's always been the case. The state's one that's had them. They're not um, looking the, for the grill marks the way KCBS judges aren't looking for garnish? <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> but, you know, and you got to think about this too, though. When they cut these steaks, the it can look. It's one thing to to judge the looks when it's in the box, not cut. You can clearly see the grill marks. You can tell if they're perfect or not. But the judge isn't seeing them in that steak. They're seeing it cut and usually separated out, and a lot of times propped up. So it's not. I don't know if it's as big a factor. I don't know. Maybe it's a mental thing for me. But I mean, I don't know. If, I would. I would. I would always cook on grill crates just because I've had the luck with it. I'm not saying it can't be done. I'm just saying it's not not as likely for it to you know for you to do well without doing them. Of the three components that are stereotypically considered to be what you need to win at an SCA event, grill grates, B and B charcoal, and a PK grill, whether it be a 360 or original, would you say that the grill grates are the one that stands high above the other two, or the other two pretty close to the grill grates? You give me a grill grate and a thermopin, and I'd cook on anything. Those two things are critical. Um, and I'm just a, I'm a thermopin guy, man. I don't think you can beat those thermometers. I don't get paid by them. I heard but that. that's besides my grill, or you know, in steak cooking, besides my grill grates, I'm I'm having a thermopin. Who's the best steak cook right now in the SCA, in your opinion? Man, that's tough. It'd be hard not to say uh, Chuck Edwards because he's the man from last year. He's the man to beat, and. Uh, but, you know, there's a lot of great – the thing about SCA cooking is anybody can win on a, any given day. I've seen more first-timers win in SCA than any other competitive food cooking that I've done. And it's, I think it's just because we're cooking a ribeye steak, and a lot of people are familiar with them, and, and it doesn't take anything super elaborate or super out of the box to win. You can cook a good, if you can cook a good steak, you can do it. I'm getting a couple people ask me in the instant chat here, Malcolm, if because uh, we're coming up to this portion of the season where it's like events. You have har uh, home hearth patio. You have MBBQA. Are you going to be attending any of these? I don't. I know I'm going out to a special event in Utah, in Salt Lake City. Uh, I think it's next week for Traeger. They're doing. They're unveiling some new grill. They're keeping all hush hush. Um, I may be at the MBBQA, but I'm not 100 percent positive because my son's playing baseball. And this is a bad time of year for, for me to squeeze some cooks in and still make his baseball games. It's tough. So I may have to sacrifice some of those, um, you know, shows or conferences that I like to attend this year. From a YouTube update, what's new on the video side? Man, we're just trying to uh, come up with some new recipes and new ideas and, and, and get our podcast going, too. I know uh, you kind of sparked my interest in podcasts a lot last year at the MBBQA, and me and Rochelle kind of stuck with it and are trying to figure it out. We're nowhere near, you know, pros yet, like like yourself, but, but we're having a good time with it, and that's what we're going to continue to do. I'm going to try to do I, – I, I try to do a, a recipe a week, but there's some weeks like this week it's super cold. I didn't do anything. I gave myself a week off, so. Here's my but advice. Ready? Here's my advice. <clears throat> Do it for a year, and then do it for another year, and then do it for 12 more years. Then come talk to me, pal. I'm, I'm with you on that, man. Meanwhile, you got half a million subscribers on YouTube, so who the hell am I? Uh -oh. You know what you're doing. You know what you're <laughs> well, doing, pal. You got it. I, I put the same philosophy. <laughs> we put the same philosophy in YouTube. You know, we start. I, I know I started a little bit after you. Um, 
And because I remember coming on your show earlier, you know, back earlier in my YouTube yep. career. Yep. And it was just one of those things, man, where, you know, I saw you sticking with it and then we decided to stick with our YouTube. And, and that's the one thing if you say and everybody when people ask me, it's being consistent and sticking with it. I know it's hard and, and, you know, it seems like you may not be getting anywhere. But, man, over the years, it pays off. No doubt. Malcolm Reed can be found how to BBQ right dot com, how to BBQ right on all the social media handles and the pitmaster of Killer Hogs Barbecue can be found here the first Tuesday of each month. Malcolm, always appreciate the time, man. Thanks so much. Hey, looking forward to next month, Greg. Have a good one, man. You got it. There he is, Malcolm Reed. We got zero deer talking, but hey, we get to talking. I mean, that's how it is.